this video will be analysing the case of Miller and the Secretary of State for exiting the European Union. Judgment in our case was given by the United Kingdom Supreme Court in 2017 and was the result of an appeal by the Secretary of State from a de decision that had been made by the Divisional Court. Now the background to our case can be found in the 2016 referendum whereby the people of the United Kingdom voted to leave the European Union. However, this result was not itself enough to trigger withdrawal. That withdrawal could only be achieved by the UK acting in accordance with its international law obligations, specifically Article 50 of the Treaty of the European Union. Now, this article provides a number of things. Firstly, it says that any member state may decide to withdraw from the Union in accordance with its own constitutional arrangements. So this then begs the question, what are the UK's own constitutional arrangements in this context? And the second thing that Article 50 says is that a member state which decides to withdraw shall notify the European Council of its intention. And this then begs, begs the question, who or what within those UK constitutional arrangements can decide upon or authorising um, that notice should be given. And you might have heard that the notice um, or the giving of the notice was often referred to as triggering Article 50 and the, the legal basis for that triggering is what the case of Miller is all about. So the case of Miller revolves around these constitutional issues. Um, but if one were to look at the long title of the case, we could see that as well as the specific claim that's made by Miller against the Secretary of State, the court was also asked to rule on whether the devolved arrangements for Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland had a part to play in the process. And this is the, the second issue. Now, in the case of Miller, Nord Newberger gave the majority judgment. Um, in this, he was joined by seven other justices. And at the outset of his judgment, he indicated that questions relating to the constitutional arrangements of the country are some of the most important questions that judges have to decide. And in this case, the court was being asked to decide questions that go to the very heart of constitutional law and what constitutional law is all about, namely the allocation and the proper exercise of power. And from a separation of powers perspective, it can be seen from the outset that there was no suggestion that the judiciary was not the proper um, institution to be deciding these issues. Now, that type of analysis, looking at the case in its constitutional context, is a valuable insight that this type of case provides, particularly for those studying constitutional law for the first time. For example, within the majority judgment, Lord Newberger conducts an analysis of the relevant constitutional background. And here, for example, he provides a useful reference to the statement which reads as follows. The UK does not have a constitution in the sense of a single coherent code of fundamental law which prevails over all other sources of law. Now, statements such as these are made in the first chapters of constitutional law books, and indeed I make such a statement in the first lecture of, constitutional, of the constitutional law module that I teach. But as students, not only should we seek to understand the law, but we should examine it in such a way that we are looking for evidence to support not only what we might learn, but what we might want to recite in the future, particularly in the works that we ourselves produce. Um, and as authority goes, of course, a president of the Supreme Court is pretty good. So if I was in your position, I would be noting where within the judgment is said so that I've got good authority for a, a highly um, relevant and useful statement um, for future use. And I should say, by the way, it's in para 40 of the judgment, if you want that full reference. So that's a sort of contextual look at the, the case, that, or a contextual approach that we can look. Um, 
Because the actual decision and reasoning on Article 50 is important, but there's a lot to be gained from examining the case as an example of not just adjudication on an issue, but in the sense that it is in itself the Constitution in operation. Um, so I advise you to look at it in, in, in that light, as, um, because I think it would be helpful, particularly for students at the University of Surrey. But if we move from that wider perspective and look at the issue that's raised by Gina Miller in the case, referred to as the, the main issue, here, the argue, government argued that it was entitled to trigger that Article 50 provision that I mentioned using its powers under the Royal Pro Prerogative. Now, I will say more about the prerogative in a blog post on this site. But for now, if we look at the definition that the court adopts in its judgment, it talks of the prerogative as being the residue of powers which remain vested in the crown. And here, when they say crown, they mean government. And these powers are exercisable by ministers, providing they are consistent with parliamentary um, legislation. Now, the need for that consistency, for prerogative powers to be consistent with legislation, tells us that prerogative powers are subordinate to statute. And again, as we read this, we should be considering the constitutional context and perhaps reach our own conclusion that this makes perfect sense in a system that's based on parliamentary supremacy. Now, that was the government's argument. Alternatively, Miller argued that as withdrawal from the EU would result in a change to domestic law, the prerogative power could not be used, and in accordance with the UK's constitutional arrangements, therefore, the approval of Parliament was required. Now, on this main issue, where there's this distinction between the executive that says prerogative powers can do the job and Miller that says no prerogative powers need, or in this case, the triggering needs the approval of Parliament. On this issue, it was agreed between the parties that it was well established that government possesses this prerogative power to enter into and withdraw from treaties as part of the conduct of foreign affairs. So that was not disputed. The question whether whether the power was wide enough to allow the alteration of domestic law. Now, in order to answer this question first, um, the court conducted a review of the law stretching back to the 17th century. And here, Lord Newberger identified that there was no power to use prerogative to alter domestic law. And you will see, if you look at paragraph 45 of the judgment, for example, that he identifies a classic authority in support of this assertion, namely the 1916 case of the Zamora. He also adds to his um, analysis that prerogative powers must be compatible with statute, but they must also be compatible with common law. So not only can they not be used to alter statute, but they can't be used to alter the common law as well. Now, having identified, importantly, that prerogative cannot alter the domestic law, the court then goes on to consider the relevant domestic law. And of particular importance um, in this context becomes the um, European Communities Act of 1972, in particular, Section 2.1 because this acted to make European law directly applicable in domestic law. Some European law has direct effect in our own domestic arrangements. And this section is referred to in the proceedings as a conduit through which law made at the European level moves straight and directly into domestic law. So it's the conduit through which that law throws. And the court concluded, the majority judgment at least, that this conduit um, within the ECA made EU law a new source of domestic law. And withdrawal from the EU would mean that, therefore, the UK would lose that source of domestic law. Now, in answer to the question of the extent of prerogative power, the court said this at paragraph 81 of its judgment. This is quite a long quote. Um, 
Accordingly, the main difficulty with the Secretary of State's argument is that it does not answer the objection based on the constitutional implications of withdrawal from the EU. As we have said, withdrawal is fundamentally different from variations in the content of EU law arising from further EU treaties or legislation. So for the majority, there's a difference between changes made at the international level in the ordinary course of European law changing, and of course, when they come through the conduit, that may change domestic law. And they make a complete distinction between that type of change and the type of change that's made by withdrawal. And you'll see um, later in the judgment that Law Reed, in his dissenting judgment, um, he disagrees with them on this. But continuing with the quote, a complete withdrawal represents a change which is different not just in degree, but in kind from the abrogation of particular rights, duties or rules derived from EU law. It will constitute a significant a constitutional change as that which occurred when EU law was first incorporated in domestic law by the 1972 Act. And, if notice is given, this change will occur irrespective of whether Parliament repeals the 1972 Act. It would be inconsistent with long-standing and fundamental principle for such a far-reaching change to the constitutional arrangements of the UK to be brought about by ministerial decision or ministerial action alone. All the more so when the source in question was brought into existence by Parliament through parliamentary legislation which gave that source an overriding supremacy in the hierarchy of domestic law sources. So the court says that it would be wrong for executive government using powers to change domestic law, but even more so when that law that it's uh, um, seeking to change was brought about by the Supreme Parliament. So, in effect, those far-reaching changes that the majority identified were way beyond the reach of the prerogative. Now, in reaching that conclusion, the majority went further than just saying that the prerogative couldn't alter domestic law. They also looked at the ECA and they interpreted the ECA to mean that Parliament intended a type of membership of the EU that was inconsistent with ministers thereafter using prerogative power to withdraw from any such treaties. Um, the use of prerogative was in effect precluded by the statute. And we might in some ways understand why they reached that conclusion because of course that supports this fundamental aspect of parliamentary supremacy. Um, and we know that parliamentary supremacy um, is such that it could override the prerogative it, it meant to. The prerogative is subordinate to Parliament. So that is the majority judgment on the first issue. There were three judges that dissented on this issue, um, and by dissent, of course, I mean that they disagreed with the majority view, and all three of those wrote separate legal opinions, um, but the most detailed came from Lord Reed, and in a nutshell, he suggested that as the European Communities Act only provided a conduit for matters existing at international level, it was not incompatible with the statutory scheme for the prerogative to change what was happening at the international level, even if that meant that it extinguished all of the law that could potentially come through that um, conduit for him, if I read the key words um, from paragraph 186 of judgment, he said that in section 2.1, the relevant category is rights, powers, liability, obligations and restrictions from time to time created under the treaties. Now, the words for him from time to time, which appeared twice in that section, he said is concerned not only with the treaties and the regulations and other legal instruments made under them as they stood at the time of accession, but also with the treaties and instruments under them as they change over time. And this recognised that rights and powers and liabilities created under the treaties alter from time to time and as a result of changes to the treaties or the laws and procedures that made under them. Um, and as these matters were envisaged to change from time to time, he thought that the ECA did not prevent the operation of the prerogative to change international law. 
In fact, Parliament, he thought, had recognised this by the wording of the statute, in particular time, that phrase, from time to time. Um, and in that sense, he thought that there was no basis for the view advanced by the majority um, to the content, this idea that the changes to the content of EU law were to be regarded as differently to changes resulting from withdrawal. For him, he thought, well, they may be different in terms of scale, but they were not different in terms of law. So that is the majority view and the dissenting view, and of course the majority view prevailed on the main issue. I'm just going to deal briefly with the second issue, which is the, the devolution issue in the case. Now, there were two specific matters in this respect, and they can be dealt with quite quickly. The first, for completeness, was the question of whether the provisions of the Northern Ireland Act itself meant that UK legislation was required to affect withdrawal. But as the court had already decided that Parliament should trigger Article 50 and that this was likely to involve legislation, um, they did not just need to decide this issue. So I, like the court, put that issue to one side and look at the second devolution issue. Um, so having decided that the UK Parliament should consider this on the main issue, the aspect or the more interesting aspect of the devolution issue was whether there was a requirement to consult the devolved legislatures in Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales before proceeding. Now, the claim that there should be consultation arises from a constitutional convention, in this case one named the Sewell Convention after the um, relevant Minister of Scotland at the time. Now, of course, as you may be aware, on granting devolved powers to um, Scotland, Northern Ireland and um, Wales, the government, when they did that, they retained the power to legislate even on devolved matters, um, thereby retaining the Westminster supremacy of Parliament. But what they did say is that they would, by convention, always consult before they legislated in that way. And that convention was written into an MOU, and we do see it now um, mentioned in the Scotland Act and more recently in the Wales Act of 2017. Now the question then arises whether if the removal of EU obligations which the devolved legislatures uh, had, whether that would, because it would change the competence of those legislatures, whether consultation should take place. Now this was also a question that the court declined to answer, but for different reasons and for interesting traditional legal reasons. Now, the court declined to answer, and in this case unanimously, all 11 justices were unanimous on this, by applying a traditional view of the legal unenforceability of constitutional conventions. Now, Dicey had recognised constitutional conventions as a form of constitutional morality. Um, in this regard, they are rules, but not legal rules enforceable by the courts. And in this vein, adopting a Dicean type view, the court stated that judges can recognise the operation of particular political conventions in the context of deciding a legal question, but they can't give legal rulings on the operation or scope of a convention because those matters are to be determined in the political world. In effect, conventions are not matters for the courts. As Lord Newberger stated in this regard, the role of the judges is to protect the rule of law and not this political world. And I like this statement for the reasons that I mentioned when I began the video about it giving us a, an insight into constitutional arrangements. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is Miller, at least in a nutshell. It was one of the most controversial cases of modern times, albeit perhaps for its political rather than its legal context. Um, however, the questions that were asked in the case were relatively specific um, in a legal sense. And for me, in terms of the study of law, the value of Miller lies not in the questions answered, but the fact that almost all aspects of the Constitution are in play in the judgment. At first blush, it looks like a battle between the executive government and parliament, 
And while to some extent it was, Parliament was the winner, for example, it was neither Parliament nor the government that sought the litigation in the first place. This litigation became with a claim by two concerned individual citizens. And this, from this judgment, shows the power of judicial review in a liberal democracy. Less human rights, the case of Miller, is a constitutional law course in itself. And my advice, at least to students of, at Surrey, is that you read it in that context.